doing all sorts of stuff. Not only network uh, level uh, sniffing, um, but also like pulling stuff off the local system. Just a ton of different tacks. But unfortunately, it jams so many things in the one little GUI interface that it's sometimes hard to find your way around it. Um, but let's go ahead and dump some things. For some IE passwords, we'd actually have to go into protected storage and dump those. Now, I'm using a much newer version of IE, so uh, we're not going to get anything there. If I go into IE7 passwords and click the plus sign to dump those, you see that I have a Google account, and the password is password with a funky uh, spelling. And the username is some user IG. Uh, I could do this for a few other different types of resources as well. But um, that shows you a simple way of dumping a couple of these passwords using Kane. Also, I have the option to uh, do much the same thing in Nier's tools. Under your tools, Nier tools, I have uh, a couple of different odds and ends. Like I have IE pass view, <coughs> same information. Also, I like Nier's tools as far as being able to save out items. And, um, oh, let's go to uh, Passbox. If you really want to, those locations I point to in the slides, you can go look at them manually, but unless you're actually trying to develop your own tool, it may not be a whole lot of point. And you see there's a different site here, bad password as the password. And uh, I pulled that out using Password Box. Now, if you did this in your own system, you should have a whole lot more passwords if you store passwords at all. By the way, Neo also has some tools for... Um, now, maybe some people are paranoid and they don't store any passwords on a local browser, but how about your phone? Or do you manually type in your password for various things all the time on your phone? Neo also has some tools for some phone OSs, at least, uh, uh, at least Windows Mobile, to go in and uh, extract passwords in much the same way. Which is pretty nifty. Yes. Now, will this box, password box, get the? Uh, they are using a master password on their name. I don't believe it will for that. I have to do some more looking into that. Um, also, another thing I like about Nears tools. Uh, here, I'm ha actually have access and logged in as the person. But even if you're not logged in as the person, if you go into the help file for it, there's a bunch of command line options so you can automate this. How many people have ever seen uh, the USB hacksaws? You know, those little free, view free thumb drives people plug in and have them automatically set to run a bunch of stuff. Well, you can easily script one of those to run Nears tools in command line and dump the things automatically into like a common delimited file that you can open up later on in pretty much any app you want. Also, if I wasn't logged in as, a, as some user, I was logged in as someone else, I could just point it towards the profile that I want to extract passwords out of. If the person is using, um, like, say, a uh, portable Firefox off of a thumb drive. I might be able to point it at a different install folder. Nearest tools come up with a ton of things. Some also, always look at the help file, because some also support grabbing things from a remote system. So let's say you have the password on one box, you know the same local administrative password is on another box, you can use that to reach across the network, grab stuff off the other box from someone else's account. So always look at the help file on Nearest tools. He's just got a ton of stuff that these things can do. But uh, that's a quick example of uh, using a password fox and IE fox. By the way, that IE fox, that's IE fox, uh, that IE uh, password viewer, if I had changed the hash, like for instance, I could have used a salad as a password renew and changed the uh, password on some user, but if I'd logged in, I wouldn't have been able to recover anything. Because apparently, it stores whatever hash the person was using at the time, it uses that hash to add an extra level of encryption for like um, passwords it stores. So if I change that hash, if I change the person's login ID, uh, login password, it totally screws me up. Just letting you know. At least in uh, IE version 7. Okay, let's talk a little bit about uh, RDP and VNC passwords. These are more things you can have fun with. Um, First of all, I'll talk a little bit about VNC. This is a classic. Uh, now, the mod version of VNC I play with anymore is usually Ultimate VNC if I do things at all. Pretty much all my boxes nowadays, either I SSH into or I use remote desktop. Or if it's a Linux box that I really want a GUI, I um, 
use something called a no machines client, the little NX client, which is alternative for SSH. I find it's pretty nifty. Can you give the good recommendations for a GUI remote for, for Linux? Uh, free NS or NX that you're talking about is probably about the best. You can also just run X over SSH, too. All those are good options. Some people use VNC. Um, uh, you can do, I'm not sure if it's attacking Windows. Same, similar attack in, it probably is going to work in uh, Windows, though instead of the registry, I think it's just a file on the file system. By the way, do you know anything about um, how uh, Ubuntu and by chat by a uh, no, by sort of interpolation, uh, I guess, um, that chat stores uh, stored credentials like your keyring. You know much about keyrings? I'm covering mostly Windows yeah, 7. Yeah, it just depends on the... I mean, there's it's it's just stored in a hidden file, the hash for, like, known key ring. And so I think those are hashed with SSH. Or SHA512, the same as the, the, the uh, Etsy password directory okay. is. But is it just me, or does John by default not support uh, SHA256? Or, so, sorry, SHA512. You have to have the Jumbo patch. Jumbo patch? I'd be interested in seeing something about that. All right, um, but old versions of VNC used to have things stored in these particular registry keys depending on the version. I haven't messed with these in a while, but it's possibly the same location. I'm going to be showing where it is in Ultimate Boot CD for Windows because I'm more familiar with Ultimate, sorry, nah, uh, Ultra VNC. I get tongue tied from time to time. All right. Uh, by the way, the way these are obfuscated is really kind of dumb. Essentially, they're DES encrypted. However, the DNS DES encrypted, digital encryption standard, with a known key. It's always the same key. And it's keys in the source code. These are open source projects. Not that if it was in closed source, people wouldn't find it also. But I'm just saying, what's the point almost? But anyway, they use this particular key to encrypt it. DES. Uh, okay. Well, I want to show how Ultra VNC did it. Uh, but doing some looking around and doing some reverse engineering on one of our nearest tools, I was able to find it. It stores its password in ultravnc.ini. And I'm going to go actually show that file. Let me see. Where one of these? All right. If I go into a C program files, uh, ultravnc. Uh, there's an INI file in there, LGBNC INI. Instead of storing it in the registry, it essentially just puts it in here. Now, here's one difference it that has. That's ex it uses the exact same encryption algorithm. It originally was going for a loop because the hash comes out, it's different. That's because they add on two extra bytes. And what these two extra bytes are really for, I don't know. However, this part right here, it's using the exact same, well, I can't call it a hash because it's definitely not one way. Uh, it's using the exact same algorithm for obfuscation. Uh, I could take that and basically unencrypt it with that same key. However, rather than doing that by hand, well, I can't do DES by hand. Uh, oh, you know, using someone's tool for DES, let's just go ahead and, uh, once again, use a friendly tool from Neosoft. Uh, and this one supports a bunch of different versions of VNC, not just Ultra VNC, but um, Ultra VNC is one. Oh, crap. Uh, <laughs> this play, well, the password is a uh, uh, four letter word. And by the way, you're going to find, if you try, I'm going to talk a little bit about the inverse attack. I meant to change this before I actually put this up. I had it as a different password at one time, and then I um, changed it to mess around with some things, and I forgot to change it back. Uh, it's something I like to call an inverse brute force attack, where you essentially take one password and try it on all the usernames for a system. Because someone out there you know is going to use one of George Carlin's uh, seven words you can't say on TV. Mm -hmm. So use those seven words and try every single account. You're less likely to hit uh, uh, account lockout restrictions. And someone out there, assuming they have bad password policies, is probably choosing one of those four-letter words. There you go. Uh, but that's uh, VNC pass view. Uh, later on, I may show actually how you can actually look at an unknown application and try to figure out where it's storing passwords. Oh, but let's go on to the next section. Uh, remote desktop protocol. Now, it used to be that remote desktop protocol in some versions of it 
would actually store it. You'd have this little RDP file. And I'm actually, now nah, let's switch over and uh, I think I may have an RDP file someplace or another. Let's see. Do I have an RDP file on desktop? Yeah. Here's a little RDP file. If I was to edit it, we would notice it's just the text file. However, I just recalled that one I actually put some of my own special information in. So, hold on just a second. <laughs> Let me uh, do something a little different here. Plug this back in. Ruben, would you be so kind to look at that and see if it's still tracking? Yeah, it's up. It's up? Yeah, I see your Windows Explorer and stuff on there. All right. There you go. And is the size okay or does it have a bunch of. Looks good to me. Cool. Sorry about this. I want the at home viewers to be able. Still okay? Yeah. All right. Essentially, if you open up that RDP file, I just opened it up in Notepad. Uh, you'll see it's just a text file. Usually, the password would be stored in this. Newer versions of a uh, remote desktop protocol as a uh, client don't do that. Go figure. Um, they actually store it in the same place that uh, network credentials, which I'm going to talk about later in the show. Uh, there's actually, a, though, luckily, a tool for that. There's a few tools that Neil releases. If you do have an RDP file that's one of the older formats, you can either use a RDP pass view. And I just revealed more than I should have. Um, but that doesn't seem to actually pull it out. There's also a tool like that built into Kane. Um, but like I said before, it's not going to work for um, our purposes here. However, if I use the um, network pass, it would work. Because it's stored in the same place that uh, stored network credentials get stored. And I'll talk a little bit about them later on. So you can easily pull out RDP passwords as well using these tools like NetPass or RDP. I'm trying to remember the exact name he uses. Yeah, RDPV. All right. A few uh, stuff that I've already demoed. These are all those different tools, and they all should be in that pack I sent everyone. All right. Instant messaging. This varies a lot depending on where things are saved. If you go check out Neo's page on save password <laughs> locations, generally speaking, if you save your password in an IM client, it is recoverable. Uh, but there's so many different IM clients out there, it'd be hard for me to point you to every single way it can be done. I usually use Portable Pigeon, so let me show you how to uh, recover something from Portable Pigeon. Or Pigeon Portable. Uh, doing this by hand kind of sucks. I can go look at that file, but you know what? It actually would be informative to do that and show that file. So I'm going to do that in a second. Uh, luckily, Neo coming up with a tool called uh, Mess and Pass. And Mess and Pass does all these different IM clients. Windows Messenger, MSN Messenger, Yahoo Messenger, different versions, Google Talk, Windows Live, uh, Game, Pigeon, Digsby, Miranda, Trillion, MySpace, IM. Is there any major one that you all can think of that's not in that list? Okay. Skype, well, it's kind of I am, it's kind of not, and um, he does have some tools for pulling logs, and I've actually been able to, using some of the tools I have, I think I've kind of figured out where Skype puts its password, but I'm not sure what it's using for obfuscating it. Facebook would be an interesting one. What's that? Facebook chat. Facebook chat. Well, that would be part, would be stored in your web browser, though, wouldn't it? Or is that a standalone client? Yeah, because yeah, the client, there's no standalone client. So I think there are some standalone clients. Oh, there are? Okay. Well, those standalone clients then might have a way of recovering it. Otherwise, you're just talking about recovering your Facebook 
password, which would be recoverable 